This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, if you look at the English statute book, you'll find the following lines. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. These words have been there for 794 years. They're clause 39 of Magna Carta. Issued by King John in 1215, Magna Carta is seen as the foundation of English law and liberty. It includes clauses on universal justice, but it has 63 clauses, and one, for instance, on the fishing rights in the Upper Thames. Magna Carta is both a proclamation of law and, as sometimes can seem to us, rather hotchpotch of baronial ambition. With me to discuss Magna Carta are David Carpenter, Professor of Medieval History at King's College London, Michael Clanchy, Emeritus Professor of Medieval History at the Institute of Historical Research, and Nicholas Vincent, Professor of Medieval History at the University of East Anglia. Nicholas Vincent, King John's a famous villain of English history, and Magna Carta happened on his watch in 1215. Does he deserve the reputation he has? Well, you see, most villains in the past, they're sort of found by modern historians to be good in parts and not good in others. John really was an absolute rotter through and through. The worst king in English history, possibly. Uh, in the 14th century, 150 years or so after the events of 1215, the barons considered the possibility of promoting John of Gaunt, the son of Edward III, as king. And one of the principal arguments against any such idea was the fact that he was called John. There could not be another King John. Matthew uh, Paris, uh, the, uh, uh, from uh, the Chronicler of St Albans, wrote, Foul as it is, hell itself is defiled uh, by the foulness of John. Yes, well, uh, that's certainly a fairly damning judgment, isn't it? Uh, what did he do wrong? Yes, well, I'd quite like to know that. <laughs> he, uh, I suppose, he failed in all the respects in which his father had succeeded. He was the son of a very, very successful father, Henry II, who had built up this extraordinary Plantagenet empire in France. Henry II had killed his Archbishop of Canterbury. Henry II had fathered endless illegitimate children, but had succeeded... John didn't do anything like uh, crimes on those sorts of scales, and yet failed. He lost Normandy. He killed his own nephew, Arthur of Brittany. He lusted after the wives of his courtiers, and those courtiers were able to object to that in such a way that eventually that led on to rebellion. He failed, above all, to reconquer the lands that his father had gained in France. He lost Normandy in 1204, and thereafter, despite accumulating huge sums of money, that money was wasted entirely on a campaign in 1214 that ended at a battle, the Battle of Bouvines, where King John's armies were decisively defeated. Uh, all of that, of course, contributing to this growing sense of unease against the king. We have to remember that he was a Plantagenet, as you said, France, northern France, was his real domain. I assume he was French-speaking. Um, he, uh, he was therefore a sort of exiled to England. He was uh, <laughs> uncomfortable here. Uh, he came here really to loot it, to get money, to go back and get what he thought he'd lost. There's what he had lost, sorry. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of truth in that. Eng England had always been the milch cow of this empire. It was England that actually had the resources to pay for the maintenance of the king's armies in France. Uh, and the other thing, of course, to remember there is that kings since the Norman Conquest had been resident on both sides of the Channel. John is the first king in the past 50 years who, from 1204, was permanently resident in England. That meant that he was constantly on your doorstep. He was constantly calling round, demanding money, eyeing up your daughter or your wife, in a way that previous Plantagenet kings had actually been uh, healthily uh, set aside in France. Now, we're talking about a time in medieval, <coughs> medieval history of, of great papal authority and some papal power. And again, in 1207, he fell out spectacularly with the church over Stephen Langton. Can you tell us who Stephen Langton is? Because he's important in the Magna Carta and why they fell out. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Stephen Langton was Archbishop of Canterbury from 1207. He, for the previous 40 years, had been one of the leading expositors of biblical exegesis, the study of the Bible in the schools of Paris. And for 40 years, he had commented clause by clause on the meaning of Scripture. Two consequences from that. First of all, a realization that God's laws were to some extent set out in the Bible, particularly in those Old Testament books like Deuteronomy, where the laws of God to govern mankind were actually set out. And one theme in Magna Carta is this theme of binding the king to the law, the law of God. Secondly, in doing all of that, Langton had been forced to reconcile passages in Scripture that were seemingly irreconcilable, the, the distinctions, the differences within the various books of the Old Testament. And that, I think, is very important in imagining Langton's position as a reconciler of the barons and the royal party in 1215, someone who was accustomed to making peace. David Carpenter, we're going towards 1215 now, but we're looking for background here. A lot of talk of the barons uh, and the, the uneasy relationship with the barons. You would have thought that they'd have been united behind him because they had lands in Normandy yeah, and northern France. Yeah. They, you would have thought they wanted to say, come on, John, we're back you all the way. We want our stuff back over there. But not a bit of it. They were against him, really. Can you? I've been very uh, elliptical and vernacular <laughs> in that. I do excuse. But please, can you develop that? Well, I think the charters essentially got two main themes, and one is money, and the other is justice. And clause after clause of the charter is designed to restrict the money-getting operations of royal government. And I think the background there is that John had hugely increased his revenues. He tripled his revenues over the course of the reign. Now that impacted on the realm as a whole, but it particularly impacted on some of the greatest barons who found themselves having to pay their debts to the king. I mean, a good example is someone like Nicholas de Stuteville, who John demanded that he pay £10,000 to inherit his estates, where Magna Carta thought... Sorry, £6,000 to inherit his estates, when Magna Carta thought about £100 was... Was, was reasonable. The other theme, I think, is, is so we're justice. talking about extortionate taxation Extor of the powerful, oppressive taxation, yeah. in which you know the revenue has increased two or three times. You can see that from from the pipe rolls of uh, of John's reign. This gigantic financial pressure. I mean, the other side is is justice, and you were so right to read out at the start. You know, the most famous clause of the Charter Thirty Nine: to no you know no free man is to be outlawed and without lawful judgment of his peers saved by the law of the land. And also equally important was the one to no one, to no one will we sell, delay, right or justice. And, you know, John could absolutely be convicted of, of all of that. I mean, if you take Stuteville's case, I mean, Stuteville had couldn't pay the £6,000, and so John simply seized the castle of Knaresborough from him. And, you know, that was an act of arbitrary dispossession. So those are the sorts of feelings the great barons had. You know, financial pressure, denial of justice, arbitrary dispossession, all of that. And being interfered with, because they had been, uh, as, as uh, Nicholas pointed out, they had been without a resident king for a very long time. So they were warlords, sure. if, we can, if we may use that term, in their own areas, and total rulers, I presume, in their own sure. areas. Sure. I mean, Lick was so right to say that. But, but you see, in a way, there's nothing new about grievances over money and over justice. So what's new? And the difference is, is 1204. It's the loss of Normandy in 1204, which meant that John is now confined to England. As Nick said, he's on everyone's doorstep. And he's in the business of much governing England to raise gigantic sums of money to get Normandy back. I mean, I also think, though, Nicholas is completely right to talk about John's personality. I mean, John Gillingham once famously said, John was a shit, and, and he certainly was a shit of the first water. I mean, he, he, he was a murderer, he was a womanizer, and he, he deeply sort of suspicious of everybody. And I think one contemporary chronicler says about him that you know, no one trusts anyone who distrusts all the world. And, and John was like that. And I think that the arbitrary treatment of individuals comes out of this flawed personality. In 1215, the barons took drastic action. They took London, the great fortified city uh, of London, which was powerful in itself, extraordinarily powerful, and powerful as a place. Uh, can you tell us why they did that and why they got it, why, how they did it? You would have thought that John would have defended it to the last, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. Well, According to contemporary accounts, the, the, the barons actually took London through a ruse that a lot of the Londoners, um, perhaps with unaccustomed piety, were at mass. And so a faction of the city were allowed to uh, 
uh, uh, were able to, to let the, the barons in. I think, however, there was a lot of sympathy for the baronial cause in London. I mean, John had taxed London very heavily. In the last desperate measure earlier in May, 1215, he'd um, allowed the Londoners to elect their own mayor, but that was too little, too late. And as soon as the barons had got London, I mean, that absolutely transforms the, the military situation because it means John can't win the war. I mean, there's no way he could have got the barons out of London. But equally, the barons couldn't win either, because John had got, um, still got a large part of his army intact, he got large numbers of castles. And so it was out of that stalemate, the barons, London, John the castles, that the charter emerges. Well, let's just leave that as it is for a moment, let's sort of leave it as a, uh, a still frame. We've got the barons in London, and we've got John out of London with his castles and his power. And uh, Michael Clancy, can I ask you, uh, at that time... Um, in the way that has been discussed so far, it would be easy for people to assume this is a time of anarchy, uh, chaos, and so on. But there were... Uh, what was the status of the law? What was the status of justice? I, I would say really very high, and that in many ways Magna Carta is not making innovations but reinforcing legal norms which were already understood to exist, and that John's father, Henry II in particular, had... Uh, reinforced the power of royal law uh, across the whole country and you, you can say I've, I've just been said here that the barons were warlords in their areas but it is also true that they had had to accept before John came to the throne that, that they had had to accept that the, the king's law and the settlement of disputes by and large had to be through legal process and not through war um, it was becoming an exception that they should go to war with each other what, can you give us some idea of the courts the way this was informed who, who, sorry, who not informed, enforced who enforced these laws yes. that were, were, were in place and they'd been, we'd had laws in Anglo-Saxon England mm, we had a, indeed. A, a very good set of extraordinarily yep. uh, 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 exactly. well written out we know yes. about but we're talking about the 13th century beginning of the 13th century who's enforcing these laws and how well, certainly it being much it, it never been probably so strongly enforced before uh, particularly under Henry II that's from 50 years earlier or even before that the king sent out judges who were called justices that is their actual name because, but because they embody justice groups of judges to go from county to county to um, hear, please, and resolve disputes in accordance with the fixed rules which had been laid down in writing of, of the royal law. Was there any sense of equality before the law? Was there any sense of, uh, of, of justice uh, as we have come to want it to be, to expect, to aspire to? Yes, that the standard law book of the time, Glanville's book, says in its prologue that uh, no poor man will be rejected from the king's court. It wasn't necessarily true in practice, but that is the ideal which um, they a aimed at. And also it's very interesting, in, in English royal law, it, it doesn't regard ranks of the aristocracy, but it, every person before the king's law has to be a free man. But whether he is a great baron or a small, relatively small peasant... Is supposedly makes that they will be treated equally. We just talked about men, obviously, but what? Who is a free man, and how? Right. How do you get to be a free man? Yes, and and, and that and is how what, many of them? What's the and how many? What yes. proportion right, of exactly. the population are free men? Uh, um, those are uh, problematic questions. Uh, by the end of the thirteenth century, you know, Chris Dyer now estimates. He says that the majority of male males were free men, he reckons, by then. Uh, that can't be so, I think, in, <laughs> in, in, in 1200. So it would be a considerable So we're talking about one change. in three in 1200? Or I'd thought one in ten. Or one one in in and a free man... Uh, uh, just a second, I'm going to define... Mm, right. A free man is what do you have to do to be... Do you, is it property? Yes. I presume. You've yeah. got to be of that is, standing. Yeah. Well, just a second. Can you just... Uh, sorry. You, you, you've got to be of that free standing, and that means that you do not... You, you test whether you are a free man, that you do not do servile work for your lord. Servile work such as bringing in the harvest, 
annually or, or doing other menial jobs, if you did such menial jobs, that demonstrated that you are not a free man. So the free men uh, have equality in front of the yes. law. Yes, and that's uh, before w- the king's law. Yes, w- before the king's law, that's one man in ten we think, I'd and say, so no women or children. So, so in that sense, it's it's a it's a restricted yes. uh, uh, sort of justice, really. You wanted to come in, uh, David. Oh well, I, I think one in ten is wrong. I mean, I okay. think it was much more like half the population oh, really? would have been oh. would have been free. Um, right. Of course, the charter says to no one will we deny right or justice. So that mm. would include the unfree, mm. too. I just want to say slightly the background mm. in some ways for the charter is that on the one hand, the king is dispensing justice to everybody and through new legal procedures, and yet on the other hand, he's denying it to the barons. And so, in a way, what's happening in 1215 is the great barons are demanding mm. that the king obey his own rules and, and you know the king has taught everybody that he must accept these legal procedures the baron's saying we want it too so we've had a freeze frame now let's go back to what's going on they're at Runnymede or they decide to meet at Runnymede because it's halfway between London and where the king's forces are yes. uh, and so they meet at Runnymede on the Thames there's a wonderful plain the Thames, that little hill there and so on and John has plenty of castles and armies but there's a stalemate uh, can you set the scene for us Nick Well, I suppose uh, at Runnymede itself, this follows the seizure of London. It's the seizure of London that forced the king to actually come to terms with the barons. And Runnymede, remember, is one of those wonderful liminal places. It's it's uh, an island on on, on a river. And those were traditionally the places of peacemaking. And the document that we have, Magna Carta, although everybody thinks of it as a constitutional foundation stone, what, what it really is is a peace treaty between the king and the barons. And to that extent, it resembles quite a lot of other negotiated documents between kings and the realm that had been undertaken before, most obviously the coronation charter of Henry I. But we, we're talking here about a very, very powerful baronial opposition. We're talking about King John on the back foot after the disasters of 1214 where his armies had been decisively defeated, where he had squandered the vast resources that he'd acquired over the previous ten years, and where he, I suppose, above all, had shown that that God was no longer on his side. But kings in the Middle Ages who lost battles weren't merely uh, uh, losers in war. They also demonstrated that they had lost the favour of God. And one of John's reactions to that, of course, was in March 1215, shortly before the siege of London, he'd taken the cross. And he'd done that in order both to show that he was going to go on and, as it were, win back Jerusalem, but also to gain the protections that the church afforded to crusaders. And he brought back Langton. And, well, he'd already brought back Langton in, in 1213. There'd been a settlement and there'd been a lifting of all the penalties that the church had imposed. But after Bouvines, in 1214, he'd also granted liberties to the church, above all rights of free election. David Carpenter, can you give us briskly some idea of the numbers involved and then tell us about the key players? I brought Langton back in uh, because of that. He was one of the key players. So how many people turn up at that? The king brings an army, half an army? What do the barons bring? What are we talking about? Well, there are about 200 major barons in England at this time, and probably two-thirds of them were in rebellion. I wouldn't be at all surprised if most of them were indeed camped at, at Runnymede. They would all have brought their own nightly retinues, 10, 20, 30, 40 people. So I think we can think of you know, those still very evocative meadows at Runnymede by the Thames with lots of tents, about several thousand people there in rebellion. John might well have had a force of equal size, a lot of it of mercenary captain. So I think that's the sort from of where, scene. From where? Which countries? Well, I mean, d- many of them came from Normandy, from further south, the Anjou, Touraine, that sort of area. Mm-hmm. That was one reason why John was so powerful, because he did have the, this mercenary army, but also so unpopular. So can you just say the key players? We have John, we talked about the barons, mm-hmm. and we just mentioned Langton. Who was doing the dealing here? Well, Langton, I think, is playing a very important part, probably as a broker between the two sides. I mean, the major baronial rebels are people like Eustace de Vesky, uh, Nicholas de Stuteville, who I've mentioned, William de Mowbray, a lot of great barons from the north in particular, because John's rule had seemed to bear particularly heavily on the north. Rule often does. Yeah. <laughs> True. Robert Fitzwalter. Robert, Robert Fitzwalter, Fitzwalter, obviously. Who was calling himself Marshal of the Army of God mm-hmm. at this stage. Mm-hmm which is an indication, too, that they thought God was on their side. Yes, they tried to... So can you give listeners some idea that they're there for a little while? Uh, Can I bring you in, Michael? 
plenty, but can you do between the three of you? Just tell us that they've turned up those armies, there's a lot of tents, is it they're meeting every day and hammering this out? The scribes probably, oh, well, obviously, mm. copying it down, copying it down in Latin, first of all, perhaps in French as well, certainly not in English. So can you just flesh that out a bit, please? Well, we've, uh, if, if I can... Michael. Yes, I'm mm. Michael. So we, we, we don't have detail of what happened day to day, but what, what you said is, surely seems right, that there must have been meetings over a number of days, and that King John and his people, very important are the, are the royal officials, the king's judges, for example, because so much of Magna Carta concerns legal procedures, and, it, and its clauses are extremely carefully drafted. It's, it's hard to find a redundant word in any clause in Magna Carta so there are all these experts each side has got experts as, as well as strong men uh, negotiating and then as well as church men so one has to imagine that this went on day by day and that's right, they're making their, their some that they're putting in writing um, they're speaking in French I would, yeah, actually some of them probably are um, churchmen, there's no doubt that they spoke Latin to, among each other though if they knew each other they would be speaking French if that's uh, as like as not and I, I'm not I, I think some of them might have been speaking English by then too yeah I was going to say um, there's that wonderful um, schedule of um, versions of various earlier settlements in the British Library that's both in Latin and in French right. probably from Langton's own sort of private archive and we also have those predecessor documents like the Articles of the Barons like the so-called Unknown Charter which are earlier drafts mm -hmm. it looks as if this negotiation had been going on since the winter of 1214 The Articles of the Barons is 10th of June of yep. course and Magna Carta is the 15th can you just, I'm sorry to push this, but it's absolutely fascinating. Is Langton saying, no, you can't do this, you've got to do that? Do they go back and check with the uh, judges or justices? Uh, right. Well, I th there's David, a big debate David about Parker. Langton's role. Yeah. I mean, one is that he is simply a broker between the two sides. The other, that He gets he, a very good deal for the church. Yeah, he does. He, of course, he, he inserted that clause for the church. But yeah. there's a wider idea that, um, that the charter is not just a selfish baronial document but reaches out to a much wider constituency um, is because Langton told the barons that you can't just look after yourselves. I think that's actually quite wrong. And I think uh, the, the, that the charter reaches out reflected the balance of power in English society, in which barons don't rule in lordly isolation and have to um, c consider other interests. Do you disagree? With that? No, no, no. no. I, I think how Langton is the equivalent of a sort of university professor, yes, isn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah. Um, accustomed to holding meetings of all sorts and accustomed to formalising disputes mm. and finding resolution. A professor at the University of Paris, which is why John yes. disliked him so much. Yes. Yes, but, uh, but someone who can, as it were, chair negotiations, no, if, if, if right. we can Very think of yeah. 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 Can we come to the charge itself, <coughs> Nick Vincent? Uh, some of the actual clauses, there are 63, sometimes called chapters, sometimes called clauses. It's about 3,000 words long. Um, it's a mixture of the local and the universal. Mm. We're, uh, the local now seems to us sometimes merely charming. <laughs> and, uh, the universal still resonates massively yeah, all around and in much, much of the world and seems to resonate even more strongly, oddly enough, as time goes on. Right. Can you take a, a line on, on, on the content, please, Nick Vincent? Well, it, it is a hodgepodge, as you said in your introduction. It's a hodgepodge of particular needs in 1215 and wider principles. Particular needs like Clause 33, we will remove all the fish weirs from the Thames and the Medway. Well, that's for the interests of London. It's also, incidentally, for the interests of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Langton himself, who has a big estate at Maidstone on the Medway. Uh, but it's, it's to preserve those navigations for the Port of London. Um, other clauses, like uh, the clauses on the, the sale of justice, on the, the rights of the free man, which have a universal application. Interestingly, too, a lot of these clauses had, had themselves been the subject <coughs> of debate. Wider principles, like the rights of, a, of a, 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 a guardian during a wardship, those had precisely been debated in the schools of Paris before ever the barons came to Runnymede. And things that we use later, the, the, the clauses about widows, for instance. 
the rights of widows right, and yes. to their dower, the rights of minors to have their estates properly protected during their minority so that a child whose parents die when he is young should inherit the full estate when he comes of age. All of those, of course, do have resonance in later English law. But, as I think perhaps people are not necessarily aware, um, very little of the charter is still in the statute book today. It's only that those clauses relating to the church, the freedom of the church, the very broad freedom uh, to um, trial by jury or trial by one's peers, and the clauses relating to the City of London, they're the only things that remain. But the resonance is extraordinarily important, and the iconic and mythic value is, is something which has to be taken into account it's because it is there. It is absolutely uh, totally. Michael Clunchy, what did this document say that hadn't been written down in this form before? It, it, the writing before principally was the, the royal legal system depended on your obtaining writs to, to, to proceed in any way. You had to obtain a a, a letter from a king instructing a sheriff in a county to get together a jury, for example, to make a decision about whether you were the nearest heir, the next heir to an estate, for example. That's a kind of standard piece of writing. And that then initiates a, an action in the king's court which will be recorded on the justices roles there, which still exist their their plea roles and so the legal system consisted of this primarily uh, it were things in writing but not there was no sort of overall well magna carta gives much more of an overall view than you would have had before i mean just to, to develop that i think the charter is entirely new um, it pretended it was reasserting ancient law, but I mean they're absolutely no equivalent to this, these huge detail in which royal government is now regulated, save perhaps the coronation charter of Henry I in 1100, in which there are parallel. But apart from that, this great mass of regulation, nothing like it at all, it's entirely new. And it's this business of binding the king to a law, the idea that the king must have a Deuteronomy, he must have a law that he himself observes. That's why it's, it's granted not to someone who can, as it were, take it away, it's granted to God. The opening, the opening words of the actual dispositive clauses are, we grant to God that the Church of England shall be free, in order that nobody then can step in and say, oh, well, actually, I have the authority to rescind this. How are they going to implement this? Well, um, that's a jolly good question, because they had thought about that, because they thought, you know, John is so tricky that, uh, and so untrustworthy, we've got to think of enforcement. And the way it was done was that 25 barons were to be set up who were empowered to enforce the charter. So if you thought the charter was being broken, you could go to them, and they were empowered to actually seize the king's property, to make him a, a bite. The only th problem was that the names of the 25 were not in the charter. And I think that was because John was so clever. Right at the end, he issued the charter on the 15th of June, over the heads of the baronial negotiators, and said, take it or leave it. And the barons hadn't had time to choose the 25, so nobody knew who they were. But that was how it was supposed to be enforced, through 25 barons empowered to force the king to abide by it. To jump forward a bit, that was dropped. Yeah, well, it's, it's impossible, it, absolutely impossible. Remember that the king is under the law of the church. The pope actually will step in at that stage, as he as indeed did, and, and forbid any sort of constraint like that placed on a sovereign. No pope, no sovereign in the Middle Ages could accept that sort of control from within their own power base. It was inconceivable. And that's dropped from all subsequent reissues of the Charter. And what happens is it's... This is made, uh, written out, sent to all the cathedrals, sent to shires, and John reneges on it immediately. And gets the support of Pope Innocent III in doing so. Uh, for re what Nick has just said, Pope Innocent III's statement says that um, this, this is contrary to all understanding of law, and that you, 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 can't, you, you can't do this. Fortunately, he died in 1216. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the survival That's of the Charter is, is quite extraordinary because, you know, John reneges on it, the Pope has quashed it, 
so what do the barons do? They um, offer the throne to the eldest son of the, the King of France, Louis. And when John dies in that great gale round Newark Castle in October 1216, half of England is controlled by Louis. It looks as though he- John's nine-year-old son, Henry III, is going to just be swept away. And that's what ensured the survival of the Charter, because the minority government of John's son thought, in a desperate situation, uh, we must um, pull support away from the opposition by actually reissuing the Charter. Isn't that wonderful that John had actually reneged on the Charter? He'd hated it. He hated everything about it. He was obviously going to double-cross them as soon as he could. But the only way his son survived was by, was by calling on the Charter. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And remembered it, that, that, that those clauses actually relating to, to wards, to, to minors, uh, are directly applicable, of course, in the case of Henry III, too, to the wasting of a, of a minor's resource. Yeah, yeah. And so they were successful in that manoeuvre. Yes, and, and the, the papal although this chap, the, the, Fren- the French person, they controlled half of France, so we were we had a, we had a foreign king. Mm. I mean, the well, the, a foreign almost king. Yeah, I mean, the consequences if Louis had won, England and France would have come under the same ruler. So goodness knows what the future structure of Europe would have been. But yes, to win the war and then secure the peace, the charter is reissued, and then the final definitive mm. reissue is the 1225 one in return for a great tax. So, you know, throughout the rest of the Middle Ages and today, what's still on the statute book are clauses from the 1225 charter of Henry III, not John's charter of 1215. So that carries forward, uh, and it is... The charter we are really dealing with from then on is brought together again in 1225, and and it, the, the only fundamental difference there is that they've taken away 24 barons shall shall control the king in this. Otherwise, it's as hammered out as running me. Pretty well, yes. And uh, also important is the, the Charter of the Forest, which we haven't mentioned. That is that, that the, the part of England, up to a quarter of England, that was designated as forest, had slightly even more arbitrary laws than the uh, n- normal royal law. And so there are also rules made about that as well. So, let's talk about the legacy in the short term. There we are, 1225, it's played an important part in getting Henry, but we know they renege on things, so they've, <laughs> they've used it to get him, to get this boy, uh, and they've got control of the boy, those barons, they've got him on the throne, uh, away we go there, but d- did it have its great, great life, which we, we, we look back on and think, well, did it start then or did it go into desuetude for a few decades or so? We didn't go into desuetude at all. It was on everybody's lips from the 1220s onwards, from 1225 onwards. People were copying it. It was being read out in the county court. I mean, it, it was absolutely central to English politics throughout the rest of the 13th century. The question whether it made a difference is more debatable because everyone constantly said the king is breaking the charter. And of course, if you break it, there's nothing. If he breaks it, nothing you can do. I think it did make a profound difference, though. I think it did limit the king's revenues. It meant justice wasn't sold as it had been before, and uh, above all, it just asserts a fundamental principle, the king is subject to the law and cannot act in a tyrannical way, and that makes tyranny more difficult. And did it play in politics? When, when was it called on? We, I don't want to get to the Civil War yet, because that, that's very important. We'll get that in a minute. Or two. But in the 13th and 14th century, was it brought in to the argument, to the high political arguments of the time? From time to time, yes, yeah. in 1237 for example. But, but I think actually more important is that one way of showing how important it is is that there are these little books that still exist of the earliest statutes which landowners, large and small, seem to have had by 1250. And they begin with Magna Carta. So it, it shows how copies of this had circulated all around and that ev- everyone knew this was the basis of law. But w- it's used now as a great sort of lever, touchstone. Was that around in the 13th century? Yes, yeah, very much so. Right. When, when the counties want, as it were, their liberties, when the men of Devon are at odds with the king, it's the reissue of Magna Carta, the reissue of the Forest Charter that goes with it. At every moment of constitutional crisis in the 13th century, the Charter is, is reissued. And as Michael says, it then becomes law number one in the statute books. Can we just then switch to the 17th century? We have the Civil War when, uh, well, before that we have Cook, the great lawyer and MP, Jewish Cook, who makes Magna Carta, almost he reintroduces it as the centre and bedrock of English law, and he builds on that. And in the Civil War, this is taken up, and people, wonderful descriptions, he was, I was dragged off 
they tried to wrench Magna Carta out of my hands, but I fell on it and they dragged me through the, the mud, still clutching my copy of Magna. It is, becomes tremendously important in that, in, that, in, in that tremendous argument, which ends in Regislite, an extraordinary event in our history. Right. How did he get to that proportion at that time? Well, there's an irony in all of that, of course, which is, is partly to do with, with the dissolution of the monasteries and the, cl the closure of the church in the 16th century, that um, th the actual texts of the Charter begin to circulate. So these antiquaries like Robert Cotton in the early 17th century actually have access to original copies of Magna Carta, remembering here, of course, that the thing that was in the statute book is the 1225 Charter, not the 1215 Charter. 1215 Charter is a great deal more radical than the document of 1225. But those antiquaries are directly in touch with the sort of people within Parliament who are opposing James and then Charles I, the Stuarts in general. And many of the Stuarts' problems, lack of money, arbitrary taxation, lack of success in foreign war, all of those are directly linkable to the reign of John himself. So, in a sense, history comes full circle. They, they feel that the, the time has come to revive this. How important, Michael Clancy, was Cook's revision, uh, revisiting and putting the Magna Carta so prominently uh, into English law? So, Cook and these people, they have to justify what they're doing, and they have to say their opposition to the king is lawful, and therefore Magna Carta has, has built up this mythic quality as being a fundamental, unchangeable law of England, which is in writing. You can see it, we can show it to you. This is what you have to abide by. And it's very interesting that in Shakespeare's King John, there's no mention of Magna Carta. That's from Elizabeth's reign. But now... I mean, uh, what's fascinating about Cook is that it's the way in that his commentary on Magna Carta was actually published by order of the long parliament. And it was fascinating to see the way in which they sort of manipulated the charter to deal with current grievances, almost as though one might manipulate it today to prevent the reduction of funding to arts programmes. I mean, it got into that sort of area. So that ship money is against Magna Carta. Because of Magna Carta, the king must... Um, accept any bills passed by Parliament. I mean, Magna Carta was brilliantly manipulated by Coke, Cook, Pri, and all these people in order to make it relevant. And it began... Sorry. Nick, I was just going to say, also, then, of course, that leads on to later protests as well, things like the Chartists, the whole idea mm -hmm. of the Charter. In the 1840s. It, yeah. In the 19th mm -hmm. century. All of that, too, you can trace straight back to this idea of a Charter of Liberties. And that popular sense that somewhere some, somebody has a document that is actually the guarantee of your rights. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go to the National Archives in Washington today, people actually queue up and... In awe, they can't read the document, <laughs> but in well, awe. Neither can we, to prefer. Uh, 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 most of us, well, anyway, you three can. Uh, but uh, but um, uh, they, they see here this totemic symbol of their liberties. Because that's. Oh, I was going to come to that, thank you very much. Because what happened in, in, in the 1630s and 40s is the Pilgrim Fathers and others went to America. These were, these were very independent minded, very strong minded well-educated people, and one of the th things they took with them was Magna Carta, which resonated right through American history, and you could say it went up to the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, and Eleanor Roosevelt called a Magna Carta for all humanity, mm -hmm. and it was very important, and it began the exporting of Magna Carta, and then of course as the British Empire grew, it went to Australia, where well, the Chief Justice Brennan talked about it, it's uh, it's an um, incarnation of the spirit of liberty, and he went to India, uh, where Rao, when he came, Prime Minister Rao, when he came to Runnymede, praised Magna Carta. He went to New Zealand, and he went to Canada, uh, and so so on. And he began, and it was one of the big things that the, the British people carried, especially the English people carried around the world. Is that right? And that they, it's partly coincidence, isn't it, that the the people who went to America are, are exiles, usually in opposition to the royal government in England. That's uh, and that's why they went, and that in the f foundation documents of the 13 first states of, of, of America, the state of Massachusetts, 1640 or, or something. Um, you're, so supposed, you're the professor. <laughs> 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 I'm never interested in dates. Um, <laughs> sp specifically cites uh, Magna Carta, and then it gets referred to again in Maryland and so on. Mm. Do you think that the perception... So it did, it went right. Um, 
We're coming to an end now, unfortunately, but uh, do you think the perception of Magna Carta now, David Carpenter, mm -hmm. is a huge distance away from what it was in 1215-1250, what it actually was, because the perception is enormous. People reach... You saw headlines in various newspapers when the 42 mm. days thing came out, Magna Carta. Exactly. You see Poltax, Magna Carta. You see it's there, and, and we use it. We use it. We, we're very proud of it, and we use it all over the place uh, for freedoms and so on. How far is that consonant with what happened at Runnymede? Well, I think it's absolutely right. consonant. I mean, I think people at the time were oh, very aware that they were asserting fundamental principles that the ruler is subject to the law, that he can't treat individuals in an, in an arbitrary fashion. Uh, the detail may no longer be relevant and was quickly not relevant, but those fundamental principles were there at the time and that they've endured and resonate down the ages. Uh, you, know, you, you could say what it doesn't have, it doesn't have habeas corpus, it doesn't have necessarily trial by jury, it doesn't have parliament, it doesn't have all of those things stated, but the basic ideas there, you could say, are present. That, that, that basic idea that any ruling authority must be subject to law, still a very vexed question today. And any citizen can only be punished by due process of Indeed, law. Indeed, by due process things, of law. A ruler has subject to law and the citizen has the protection of the law. Absolutely. And this, these two things are in law. Indeed. The, yes. the law is our protection against government. Yes. And, that is, and so it is so important in the Constitution of the United States and, and at Magna Carta, I think, probably is more studied in the United States, in law schools of the United States than it would be in England now, mm -hmm. at, a, at a guess, by, by lawyers, taken more seriously by United American lawyers than by English lawyers. It's a rather anarchic thought to think what those barons would have made of what's happened to <laughs> now, those <laughs> de Watsits and de Watsits, and, uh, <laughs> and what they would have thought that, what have they let us in? They would say, what did we let them all in for? Mm -hmm. No, I think they would have been very proud of it, and I, I think Langton in particular would have perhaps foreseen that sort of future. I think some of the great barons would have foreseen mm -hmm. it too. I mean, nobody reads Langton's commentaries on the Bible today. Nobody, say, three or four scholars. But everybody, in a sense, has heard of Magna Carta, mm -hmm. and that's, that's quite an achievement. Well, a lot of people have heard about it this morning. Thanks very much to you three. Uh, that's to Nick Vincent, to Michael Clanchy, and to David Carpenter. And next week we'll be talking about the Siege of Vienna in 1683, and thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.